or I'll record. I got it. All right. It's, it's being recorded. First of all, uh, thank you everyone for attending this uh, session. It is our first session and uh, the first session of the series of student webinars on COVID-19. Uh, hello to everyone. I don't know what uh, time zones you are already in. Uh, good morning, good, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everyone. Uh, I'm Ahmad Reza Abbaslu. I'm from Iran and uh, the education team leader of INSIGEN. Uh, I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, before going to, to the next uh, part and before introducing Dr. Swarov, I would like to uh, give a brief story, tell a brief story about the uh, webinars that uh, we just started uh, today. Uh, I think it was about a month ago that uh, we had a very terrible news all around the world about the COVID-19 pandemics. And since that time, uh, we all know that uh, an important part of the global health, a very, very, very uh, effective role uh, belongs to students all around the board and we know that you know a significant part a significant number of healthcare workers are students already and uh and you know this the, uh, the voice of the students uh must be heard and uh we see that uh we are the we are an organization which can have students all around all around the world we, you know we have an organization which can you know uh, have uh, student leaders from different regions all around the world and now we have uh, some some of them right now in this meeting and we also we have had the honor of having many faculties who are supporting us in different aspects so we, you know, we use this opportunity to uh, have meetings, to have webinars uh, for everyone to see what students can do all around the world and what, what is the, you know, the student's role in this pandemics. And this sessions and this discussions uh, will go on with the help of our faculties, with the help of those experts who are, you know, uh, really supportive and uh, who, you know, always help us to find our ways and to do the right thing. So uh, I'm so glad to introduce Dr. Mamta Swarup, uh, the attending surgeon, the attending physician of uh, Northwestern University and the director of Global Health Center, Global Surgery Center, I'm so sorry, Global Surgery Center in the uh, University of Northwestern, and also a great advisory board for the organization which we are here, the incision. So Dr. Swarup, the floor is yours. Uh, your microphone is muted. <laughs> Oops. Um, see, we all make that mistake. I'm with Reza. Um, so I think it was like March 19th when I started seeing all of these students who were, you know, taking these initiatives, right, here in, uh, here in Chicago. And I'd been pondering the Hippocratic Oath for some time, and what was amazing to me is medical students, you know, being um, motivated by the essence of the Hippocratic Oath and feeling as though, you know, by being left out of the hospital being taken out of the hospital, being told that they needed to go home and not 
being allowed to do patient care specifically uh, and learning in that environment, they felt responsibility to their physicians who were teaching them, to the residents, to their families, to the patients. And they started doing all of these different amazing initiatives. And I'm so excited to hear even more about these and to be able to share on this platform what these amazing students were inspired to do. And it's amazing. We're going to be hearing from so many different countries um, today. And I'm very, you know, I feel very lucky that Ahmed Reza and the incision team asked me to be the moderator, the, the faculty moderator for this session. So I'm excited about this, uh, this session and I look forward to um, hearing from all of you. And I think we are going to begin with uh, Jacqueline uh, and I'm gonna hand it back over to Ahmed Reza. Thank you very much, Dr. Sorb. Jacqueline, uh, your microphone is oh. muted. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Hi. So for us here, what happened is uh, students were told that if you're in the clinical years of medicine, you have to stay behind and, uh, and help out. So we were staying behind, but some of the doctors felt like it was not safe because already the protective equipment, it was not enough for everyone. So they said they would chase some of the students that were rotating in some departments, like especially internal medicine. So because of that, they said it's not fair to have some students going to the hospital and learning. Like for me, I was in obstetrics and gynecology, so it was okay for us. They didn't mind. And then whilst other students in other departments were being told to go home. So eventually they said everyone should just go home. Uh, I'm in Zambia. So eventually everyone was told to go home. And right now, because they're saying that no one knows when this pandemic is really going to end, they're saying we should come back. But then now there's the argument that when we left, when we were told to go home, we only had cases, we only had like a hundred cases. Now we almost have like a thousand. So people are arguing that what's, does it make sense to bring us back when we now have a thousand people who are infected, when you guys told us to go home, when we only had a hundred people to go hundred people that were infected and then they're saying that we can learn online and other people are saying that medicine is best learned on the words so it really it does a huge argument going on so we're still waiting for the decision to be made and for everyone to confirm what's going on but right now what i've noticed is that the students are mostly they're stressed they're frustrated i think people are tired of just sitting at home they want to go back regardless of the risks that come with that so I don't know I, I think some courses can be learned online but then it's it's difficult for people that are in the clinical years to be saying that I'm learning online because you have to see the patients you have to work with the patients you have to clerk you have to actually examine because not everything that you read in the textbook you actually see there and not everything that you see in the hospitals is actually in the textbook so it's it's very difficult for everyone How have you guys, I'll just ask one quick question and then, you know, we're going to do the Q&A part later, but okay. how, how have you guys taken that energy? What have you done with that energy, that frustration? Okay, right now, since they said we're going to continue from where we left off, we were a week away from exams. So I think everyone is just focusing their energy on actually studying for the exams for the, and preparing for the OSCs at home and hoping that when they get there, at least would be much better, like with the exams would be much more prepared. So that's where they're channeling their exam, their energy to. And we were also having communication skills sessions online. So there's that too. That's what people were doing. But I think people are really frustrated because it's been like six weeks now of just sitting at home. Okay. Wow. That's uh. I can understand that frustration very, very. Yeah. Very. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's um, a really hard time. Uh, oh, I, 
uh, pardon me. I just wanted to ask Jacqueline to introduce mm -hmm. herself because I think uh, she forgot to introduce before starting. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah. sorry. Hi, everyone. My name is Jackie. I'm a fifth year medical student from the University of Zambia. I'm currently based in Lusaka. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, that was great. Uh, I can see that we have Carlos right here. and I, I see that Carlos is so excited to uh, have a, a talk about uh, their experience in Brazil and uh, what they have done in this, you know, uh, period and era of uh, pandemic. Carlos? Can everyone hear me? I don't know. Just a quick technical check because, you know, connection these days in Latin America hasn't been like pretty stable, hence the lack of workers in, in networking lines. Uh, but anyway, uh, hello everyone. My name is Carlos. Um, I am a junior doctor. I was a student like five months ago. So I'm really like, I've never expected that my first job would be like in the midst of a pandemic like this one, like the ones that we're experiencing. Definitely not something I was prepared by medical school to do. Um, so yeah, experiencing here, like the pandemic from Latin America, there has been like some remarks or some mobilizations into what medical students um, and junior doctors like could do about it. So um, just to like point a little bit like how the situation is, uh, I wouldn't say it's particularly good for m most of the countries and that has to um, do a lot like with a blend of medical education with political decisions that are um, being made, particularly in Brazil. We, I don't know if you've seen the news, but our president is not necessarily um, let's say that engaged like with the whole idea of, of social isolation and we have swapped uh, ministries of health three times in seven months um, which of course translates into like a political instability and just like a lack of guideline into what to do or how to act. Um, in medical students in Brazil have always played an important part during pandemics and I'm taking this comparing to what Zika uh, did to the country as well in the past. I was a medical student while Zika happened and we, we still attended uh, our classes, our clinical classes. And the reason for that is that um, we, like medical students, um, especially like those in the, in the last two years of medical school are vital for public health institutions, like for public uh, hospitals especially those in federal universities or public universities, uh, because we are generally the ones uh, taking care of patients. Like uh, most of the times, for example, uh, an attending would have, I don't know, like some 20 to 30 patients uh, to take uh, care. And one or two residents wouldn't be enough, let's say, to take care of 20 to 30 residents, uh, sorry, patients per day. So uh, interns that are like the medical students in their, in their final two years of, of, of medical education are generally the ones looking after those patients on a daily basis. And um, definitely like, those students are still, for example, going to medical school normally as if they were health workers. Uh, there was a call like for from the Brazilian like from <laughs> two Brazilian health ministers ago, which was like what like four months ago, <laughs> that medical students like, should engage into the COVID response. Uh, but then again, there is no strict guideline, let's say, of what to do, and people are taking uh, things like very ad hoc, uh, which of course represents like I don't know, like people not necessarily mm, following a specific rule or something tailored to um, a specific population um I, I i guess i don't know like if that means that we should take a look into medical education in a different way right now should we change it in the future there are many debates going on on how well not only like the political system is is done but how does the medical education guidelines that we have today reflect that necessity um, and there, there are medical students like engaged in that matter. Um, I, 
in my personal standing, like uh, I've seen like many uh, medical student forces are trying to publish more. And that is something that it, I think it's very interesting for Latin America because we are generally, um, we are generally like um, students that are depending on, you know, like professors and teachers on raising our, our voices. I don't want to say like politically, but like to do research and for us to give our, our scientific information, scientific proof of what we are living. And I think that is shifting right now, like with in, in this scenario. And I think that is something positive that we can take out of this pandemic. Um, I think I'll sum it up right now uh like at that point and then like we can move on i don't know with questions or something um but yeah i think that is a good opener <laughs> so i did, i have a question for you carlos so like how has how do you think like you know as as brazil's response has you know, politic, the political response, right? We, you know, we, I can feel your pain. Um, but how, how has the public and how have physicians um, responded in the pandemic? And how, how have you guys as medical students um, played a part in that? Um, so there are, from from our work like in incision brazil like what we've tried like to do is join kind of like the advocate movement to try to accelerate for example like medical students to to graduate um there was there are like like brazil is huge in terms of like medical faculty um like medical um universities like medical schools and like there there is not like an homogeneous um response um, to this, so I just want to point that out before like getting into having said that like from our group specifically like we are trying to join those groups that are pro uh, for example getting um, more medical um, health, health workers into the, the, the market in order to support those communities, uh, especially in the state of Sao Paulo and in the Amazon. Um, that are where like our our focal points of the pandemic and where there is like lack of of um, yeah of, of workforce let's say to supply like the pandemic um, so that is like our advocacy let's say efforts are focused into that into like right now the acceleration of of those uh, processes and then for the future then yes modifying or try to open a debate about like medical uh, education guidelines or. or it's amazing. Okay, very cool. All right. Back to you, Ahmed. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my microphone is dual muted, uh, one <laughs> from, from the headset and the other from the Zoom account. Uh, the interesting thing for me is that, you know, uh, as we hear experiences from all around the world experiences from uh, you know different countries we see that uh, you know we are experiencing and we are seeing uh, some same problems and challenges you know political issues uh, you know uh, mismanagement in a current in time uh, the decisions that uh, you know push people to uh, you know uh, to to get infected uh, by COVID-19, COVID you know, by Corona. And uh, I, I see that this kind of decisions and this kind of mismanagements are uh, seen everywhere. And, that, and that's a really interesting for me. And I'm really sad for that. Uh, 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 I, I'm, uh, I prefer to hear from uh, Gene from Haiti. I think uh, he has a great experience and uh i think presentation as i know about what experience they have in haiti uh jean uh i'm so glad to invite you as as the speaker and the floor is yours please do not forget to introduce yourself and remember we have uh about five minutes per presentation Thank can you, Dr. Swarp. Okay. Yes, can you also see my screen? 
Yes, I, we can. Okay. So, hello everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. So, I'm gonna put in a particular uh, perspective in this uh, chat. Is about is a player to involve mucosolate in the response in Haiti. It's gonna be short, but actually I'm not based in Haiti because uh, oh, in introduction I am Jean Wilkins Latik. Uh, I am the Vice President of the Medical Student Association in Chair of Hensian Haiti. And this year I am doing uh, a fellowship at Harvard BGSCC in Global Surgery. And so far now I am based in Boston, but uh, regarding uh, my uh, position in those Medical Student Association, I'm still connected with the folk there and I am, we talk every day and we are exchanging. So. The insight I want to put in this chat today is uh, that not in every country medical students are involved and I mean by the government or the authorities, but there and we we want to um, to make a player that the government consider uh, what we can provide in terms of uh, insights and workforce at the pandemic response. It's gonna be short. Uh, the presentation has to be four minutes, so I don't go over time. So we did that because we know that around the world there's um, several efforts to include medical students in the in the response to pandemic. So a bit about Haiti. Haiti is a country in the Caribbean, and uh, we have ten departments, and uh, we are in the region PAL, the Pan American Health Organization. We are a low-income country and 11 uh, million as a population. So those uh, indicators to show you that we are well, way behind the, uh, the standard in terms of healthcare resource and healthcare indicators. So we know that even strong, strong health system are uh, having difficult time to cope with uh, uh, the pandemic. So that should be even more challenging for Haiti because we have uh, we don't have the best health systems outcomes and characteristics. So, if someone can see that uh, comparing to other countries, Haiti is doing well because we just have six hundred cases, which is pretty um, pretty good comparing to other countries. But because our healthcare system is weak, so we, there's an, um, an article in a local journal newspaper this morning who says that at 500 cases, we are already overwhelmed um, by the, by the, uh, by the um, epidemic because we don't have enough healthcare resource um, workforce and ICU beds and even um, beds for hospitalization. So, so we understand that there's a need to have all you can have, all hands on deck and imply whatever resource you can have and medical student uh, uh, among the potential workforce that can contribute and uh, you know fill some of those uh, and mitigate some of those uh, lack in terms of workforce and other resources. So we did a survey and, and we had on um, almost 200 medical students when responding and among them two thirds were not in the Haitian Medical Student Association and so the majority of the students feel that the government is not including the medical student, but almost all of them want to contribute, but just half of them will contribute whatever, I mean, with no conditions, but the other half is saying that at certain conditions like personal equipments and maybe salaries that we are not discussing here. And when we ask them, we should include them, uh, we should uh, enlist the medical student. Most of them say that should be the Minister of Health, and some of them say that should be the universities, and a bit less say that uh, the medical student association should enlist the medical student. And what is interesting is when we ask them how informed they feel about the pandemic in the world, they are fairly informed. But the comparison is that uh, the medical student com uh, community is more informed uh, uh, about what is going on in the world than what is going on actually in Haiti. 
If you just can uh, have a look quickly in the graph and see that um, they absolutely, um, a third of them uh, says that they know completely what is going on about the world. They, they know that very well, but just 20% knows very well what is going on in Haiti. So as a conclusion of this uh, survey we did, so medical students have provided critical contribution to the pandemic response yeah, we're right, but for now, medical students are not being included in Haiti, and, but they do want to participate. So if we just say, I take the medical student community as a proxy for the population, we can see that even the medical student uh, community is not informed enough about uh, you know, pandemic, the pandemic response and the pandemic information up in Haiti. So uh, that raised the question that whether or not the government and the Ministry of Health is doing uh, the communication well so uh, people can know uh, how to react and protect themselves. And so that was it. And so the point of this survey and because why I'm talking about this is so you know that some uh, in some country, uh, the medical student uh, community is striving to contribute, but they are not uh, involved enough, and uh, you know their part, their potential is not acknowledged enough. Even though, uh, even strongest uh, health systems are struggling, uh, doing fairly, and our country is uh, already overwhelmed. But uh, the government and the Ministry of Health didn't realize yet that we have uh, to be involved. And this is why we wanted information to, and data to support our player. And we are trying to do this player so the medical student can actively be involved in the uh, response to the pandemic. So thank you, everyone. Fantastic. Um, thank you. That was wonderful, Dean. Um, so you said that we're not tapping the students' potential, which I think you're 100% right. I think that the potential of medical students and the energy of you all is, you know, what makes the world go around. And, uh, oh, where did you go? Um, I think that the, you know, that is a very key point in, you know, what we are, you know, unable to see at times. So my question to you, and this is going to be a question to all of you, is how can we tap into that potential? How do you think, this is a rhetorical one, and then think about this, and then at the end, perhaps we can address it after we uh, hear from uh, Makina and um, Bharat. Um, how can we tap into the potential of medical students and young junior doctors, okay, uh, in this moment in time? You know, we've had a couple of questions about, you know, how do we get PPEs to our medical students? How is it that we can support uh, students during this time? And I think that this key lies in how do we tap into the potential of those who are already in place and maximize that potential? So I would urge you to keep that in the back of your, your mind as we, uh, as we are listening to uh, Makina and Parad. So, uh, there you go. All right, Emma, back to you. Uh, hi, can everyone hear me? Okay, so I think in terms of like the experience as a medical student, um, which is what I am myself. Um, Please introduce, I think I Makina, introduce yourself and say where you're from, etc. Yeah, introduce on set. Sorry, um, hi, I'm Makina. I'm a third year medical student from the UK and I'm part of the incision team as well. Um, so I think the experience I've personally had as a medical student was that, well, the first thing that the UK did was that um, they got their final year medical students to graduate a little bit early so they could start their junior doctor 
duties a few months before they would naturally do so they could help help with the pandemic and what that raised was a lot of questions because first of all that's a big sacrifice i think the final years had to make they had to give up on their electives a lot of them had to move their graduation so they were online and then they're thrown into this completely new environment with almost little to no preparation um, I was quite fortunate in the way that that didn't affect me in the same way. Um, as a, but as a third year, I think me and a lot of my friends as well who are on the same call were kind of questioning what was going to happen to us. Um, what's happened since is that different medical students are using different approaches. Ours chose to um, stop placements as soon as possible and send us home. Um, and they actually advised medical students not to volunteer because they were worried about the potential danger we'd be putting ourselves in. Um, I know other medical students that are literally like a mile away from us that had the opposite approach. In fact, they made uh, forms from like first years to final years for them to volunteer. So there was definitely a difference in sort of the uh, the, um, the ideas that different medical schools had behind this and the kind of message they were sending out to us. Uh, personally, um, I've decided not to volunteer at hospitals. Um, I have family members that are immunocompromised and I've so and I don't want to put them at risk as well as myself what sort of like the risk that they would have from being around me if I was volunteering. Um, so what I chose to do instead, I decided to try and be as uh, proactive and as helpful as I could be but just from home. So I joined um, a few different organizations that would make public health resources. Um, I've started running sort of like well-being webinars um, with my medical school to try and keep different people interactive and I've been focusing more on about the mental health impacts that different students, medical students as well as other as well as non-medical students have been facing during the pandemic and I think the potential community impact that students who can't go out to placement can make is a very important factor that I don't think is being touched upon properly. There's a lot of uh, misinformation going around about the pandemic and people are scared and when that happens people feed into anything and everything they they are listening to in the media. I think it's a great potential role that preclinical students or students that can't go out to placements can sort of fill in for. Um, public health resources for us are very common and it's very easy for us to be able to highlight what is uh, fake in the media and what is true. That's not the case for patients and I think that is a great role that we can take on um, in this pandemic while also keeping ourselves safe but also making sure that people aren't misinformed about what's going on. I think you're a hundred percent correct. That's uh, that's really that's really great. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. There's different ways that we can um, we can contribute, right? Uh, some people are contributing to clinical care and other people are contributing in the way that you are. Um, as a trauma surgeon, they basically took away general surgery from us, right? Um, and so that all uh, we were doing is trauma and uh, critical care. And so <laughs> uh, we've been at home quite a bit and have been doing the similar things as you because they were keeping us like, you know, locked away and saved away to do ICU stuff. So I feel you, uh -huh. okay. but kudos. Uh, wellness and, you know, public health measures are very important and you're absolutely right about misinformation. So, all right. I think we're gonna get to hear from Bharat now. So I'm excited uh, to hear about, uh, about India, which is my home country. Uh, so Bharat, you also have to tell me where in India you're from, because that's... Uh... Uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Bharat Sunil Sharma. I'm from basically from Mumbai, Maharashtra, but I'm currently living in Assam, Jorat, where I'm doing my second year uh, post-graduation residency in general surgery. And as uh, Mamta Mam has already said that right now I'm not actually like, currently going any elective surgeries, only trauma cases, or uh, we are doing COVID duties. So. For residency, we are actually making a joke like we are not doing MS general surgery, we are doing MD general surgery plus a degree along with COVID-19. So we are not actually like praying to become a general surgery for now. I don't know when we'll start getting to elective surgery and we'll get to get hands-on more on surgery. 
so i'll start with um, the experience in india with respect to the undergraduate first and then next to the postgraduate so what india did is after the after the lockdown which has happened in uh, march so what they did that all the under, undergraduate students from first to final year they were sent back to home for the initial two weeks after that the final year students were called back home to help in uh, with uh, some uh, pre uh, medical uh, 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 management for the patient who might require uh, some work up since most of the doctors are busy with working in the covid duties and work so they are getting trained like an intern rather than uh, before passing it out as an intern they are just going to manage to get it train itself what happened to the first to three years soon is that the university start conducting zoom classes with uh, compulsory uh, attendance mandatory to them so they can monitor the attendance uh, whether they attending the classes as well along with that they started clinics online itself so there would be a case presentation which uh, happens online and uh, it happens college to college basis it's not like a youtube video where you can just go go and you can just see it it happens for example if you belong to some xyz college you need to go to that particular zoom channel uh, zoom uh, thing uh, zoom whatever the app is so they have to go register uh, register themselves they have to attend it the attendance would be monitored by the professor or the assistant professor itself and they would be uh, uh, have to attend it and they will go through the this thing so teaching has not been uh, uh, stopped it has been continued during this pandemic as well what happened is that uh what jacqueline has said that what uh, rotation that was supposed to be happening for them is totally cancelled but it's not completely gone since we have a uh, video conferencing they can't be able to palpitation uh, palpitation assultation and all kind of maneuver that needs to be taught to them but they can uh, actually observe it during this phase uh, now i would like to add that uh, uh, how did my college utilize this thing of uh, how final year students they have been utilizing in uh, working with uh, big group so one of my co pg resident what he did that uh, because the students were going through the classes as well uh, through online plus they used to come in the evening and make face uh, face shield okay so india is actually like so now we are starting to get more of pp but since we can't get more so what they did they, they is to get face shield so just using a simple foil of a uh, 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 plastic uh, cardboard paper with uh, using uh, what metals that we had we use a um, uh, rice tube and we uh, uh, they what did they they curved it inside the uh, the uh, foil of a uh, plastic uh, uh, board and then we can wrap it around so that even the doctors who are working without a pp just for managing other cases like Uh, surgery or obgyn or, or pediatrics they can use this field as a protection measure in, if even there is pp not available to them and we then start supplying at public health level so that uh, uh well phc and chc where they they can uh, utilize this thing even if the pp has not been supplied to them so we started this thing in our college and so uh, this can be promoted it is actually a uh, 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 the government has seen this thing and they started in doing other parts of assam as well so this we can do it over there and uh, the classes are going on and I, i i totally get that we should utilize the potential of the medical students especially the of, of pre final year and final year because i think they are already working in the uh, clinics and they have some kind of basic knowledge in how to go about the stuff but uh, for me the first year students are kind of naive they can do a lot of other things when it comes community level but uh, instead of uh, going on the front line for i think it won't be giving them sufficient a uh, backbone since uh, in, in it since especially in india the infrastructure is not that much to support uh, a, a more number of uh, patients and getting infection to uh, healthcare workers uh, now coming to post graduation uh, students like me and all my friends so it is uh, what what happened is like all the cases which was going related to surgery elective surgery especially uh, uh, coli or appendix or whether it's malignancy malignancy cases that needs surgery that uh, has been postponed uh, indefinitely we don't know when we'll be able to do that and for that thing uh, the uh, the surgical branches have been suffering and they have been posted to uh, 
the medical field. Now the course is just for three years uh, in India uh, with respect to post graduation. So we don't know how much time we'll need to repeat it or whether this would be uh, suffice during a period of lockdown or whether what would be the action taken by the government. And we have no idea clear about that. So we, as a residency, I think we are suffering from that. That's all I have to say. But where do you think everybody's gone? Like, I mean, same thing here, right? So we're not doing appendicitis that much. All, all I can, I mean, so, I, first of all, I, where has all the appendicitis and cholecystitis gone? Actually, it's the fear, actually. The first thing is that because even if like the cases that could be easily handled medically conservatively, actually, they are actually get, uh, coming after there is a perforation. So recently we did a pinnacle perforation instead of going like, like patient can come and visit on uh, just for a pain and abdomen and they will have to wait for a longer period of time in, during this lockdown. So they come uh, like directly with a major symptom. And then we have to do emergency surgery wearing PPE, which is very uncomfortable to do as a surgeon. I can, I can, I can, I've done wearing PPE and I know it's very, like, even we can't, there, there is no, there should be no uh, uh, air conditioner. There should be like, it's it's very, and especially in India, where the climate is like around now 40 degrees Celsius. So it's very difficult for us to do surgery at such a high condition. So, uh, and that's the problem we are facing. It's horrible. I know. I can't stand it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very, it's, it's, pretty nasty. Um, yeah, I think that that's a very good question about what's going to happen to these, you know, residencies, your MSc program about a three year. Even, even we have lost lots of uh, patients with respect to uh, like the protocol that ICMR has suggested that even a patient should go before surgery should initially they had that they should have a COVID report negative. So they don't spread the aerosol while intubating the patient. So because of that, the NSCR people have kind of fear whether, whether they should go with the patient head. And we have lost lots of perforation cases. So I think with respect to global surgery, it also have impacted uh, the number of patients which have been saved easily, have been uh, like a uh, uh, casualty, uh, uh, collateral damage because of that. Yeah. Uh, we should talk offline sometime. Okay, Bharat? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Back to you, Amit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bharat. You know, uh, I I was texting to Katayan, you know, uh, behind the scene now, and I was saying that uh, this experience are really incredible, and you know, I. It's my first time that I'm hearing this uh, experience and uh, these things from you, and honestly, I'm so excited right now, and more excited about you know uh hearing more in the future from you from you guys uh i want to uh you know say that uh we have a new panelist right now i'm so glad to have her here Krishna from croatia but unfortunately i think uh we have a little technical uh issues uh for 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 the camera since the you know uh, the camera is getting on uh, i would like to uh, invite and ask your katayun uh, to firstly introduce herself and tell us a little about the experience of students for covid very briefly for us can can we have christina speak first okay? uh, uh, we c i see is it okay if she speaks first of, from Croatia and then Kathy speaks? I, I, I let, me, let me see if he, if she can. Uh. Uh, hello, guys. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello, everyone, and greetings, greetings from Zagreb. Unfortunately, unfortunately, my camera doesn't work. I really don't know why but it is how it is. Uh, so, well, here in Croatia, we have a bit of specific situation uh, because students are not allowed to enter hospitals. So, uh, 
we are not in a position to help or assist in any way, uh, not even final year students. So all of us, we are banned from the hospitals. Uh, also, uh, we have additional problem due to the COVID-19 situation because I don't know if you know, uh, but two months ago, we had a huge earthquake here in Zagreb and our medical faculty uh, is, uh, let's say, destroyed. So uh, estimated damage is 500 billion kunas, which would be 100 billion American, American dollars. So our, our professors are also focused on that issue right now because we don't have uh, any conditions to have lectures. And besides that, we are not allowed to help in, a, in, in any way go to hospitals. So uh, all Croatian medical students right now are in their homes and trying to follow online lectures. But in the hospitals, uh, all the surgeries and everything that is not urgent is postponed. We don't know for how long, but this week we had a first heart transplantation uh, in COVID-19 conditions, which went successful. So our doctors are trying to do their best and uh, I'm really sorry that uh, students are not involved in that in any way. So, and uh, everyone, all medical personnel, they're all focused only on COVID-19 right now. So all specializations, everyone, they're only doing uh, jobs uh, considering that. And also all our hospitals are not working. Uh, some of them are only prepared to accept new cases of uh, COVID-19. But fortunately in Croatia, we have only two new cases per day. We have really good results. Croatia is really doing good. Our mortality is around 50, something like that, only 50 people. Uh, our numbers are uh, 2,200. So new pa uh, patients uh, at all. So I hope that everything will be fine. But uh, the biggest problem for us, the students, is lack of conditions to continue our studying because uh, when the faculty get destroyed, all uh, laboratories, everything, uh, everything went down. So we don't know when the autumn starts, uh, how will we manage to proceed further? Thank you. I, I, I wanted, um, I wanted your voice to be heard before you know, we move to to anything about everybody, because you know, our education is very important, and taking each one of your voices is important. And why it's important is because you are the future of medicine. Your future physicians, your future surgeons, your your our future. And your education, whether it's, it's a clinic, the clinical education, whether it is, you know, seeing patients and operating, you know, we have to remember and we have to invest in you all. Okay. And there's two things. One is without your input, okay we can't make a system that works for you, right? You have to have, yeah, true. right, we have to have you all help us, okay? All of these global health, global surgery platforms and things that have been created have been really nurtured and have been pushed forward by all of you, okay? Number one. Number two, Okay, the voices and the work of the students, okay, all around you, when you look at this uh, gallery of students, is not something that we can forget, nor should we ever, okay? And when I hear Jacqueline saying that she's frustrated by sitting at home, or Carlos saying that 
you know, that they're trying to gather and they're trying to figure out what exactly to do. And, you know, Christina saying that, you know, they're not getting education, you know, it, it frustrates me. But you know what, what that frustration does to me? It burns me, right? And that fire that burns me makes me want you to tell your story, okay? So something that we are going to do, okay, and what I would urge you to do, and I really want you to do, okay, since you're at home, right, okay, is I want to hear your story, okay? We're going to collect the voices of students, right? And we're going to turn them into a book, okay? You guys think I'm crazy, but you know, I, I have crazy, crazy ideas, but we are, we're gonna turn it into a book. And so I want you to send me your story, okay? And I'm gonna put the web address in the chat while uh, I'm gonna introduce, uh, I'm gonna introduce Kathy. So many of you must know Katayun, okay? Katayun is, I'm gonna introduce her as my fellow. So she's doing a two year fellowship in global surgery with me. Uh, at Northwestern, and she also happens to be the chair of Incision. That's how we're going to introduce her. She is also um, one of the forces behind a student-led initiative called Students for COVID, and she and a small group of amazing students started this idea and made it turn into this beast that Katayun will uh, now explain. But I urge every participant and every panelist here to tell me their story to tell us their story so that it can be recorded, so that it can be heard. Because the way that you see the world, the way that you hear the world, the way that you feel the world is not something that any of us can understand, okay? Let's do it. All right. Jean just said, only people who are crazy enough who want to change the world did. Let us embrace this craziness and work towards a better world. Absolutely, Jean. Let's do it. Okay. So I'll say the address. It's students number four COVID at gmail.com. But Kathy, please take over and I will put it in the chat here in a second. Hello, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I got to say this has been such an incredible panel to watch. I was not supposed to speak, just so everyone is aware. This was very much last minute that I was invited, but I'm honored to be amongst you and to hear your stories and so proud to be part of this amazing family we call Incision, to hear all the amazing work that you have been doing, how you've been adapting around the world. Um, there's so much for all of us to take in and learn from one another. So thank you for that. And thank you for being here today, part of this panel. I'm going to share my screen so we can look at the website for Students for COVID as we talk about this um, multidisciplinary group that has formed. Okay, can everyone see my screen now? I see not. Great. So Students for COVID um, formed about 19th of March, I would say. That was the initial taught, uh, as Dr. Swarif was telling you about how 
um, you know, students were coming up with these grassroots efforts and reaching out, trying to find a way to work together to, um, you know, help their community, support their community. They were sent home, but they refused to sit at home and do nothing about what was going on in their community. And the whole idea of um, the responsibility that the Hippocratic Oath places on us towards our community, towards our patients, and especially towards our um, teachers, our instructors, um, that, that was the core and center of this. Um, students for COVID is essentially a multidisciplinary group of students and professionals from around the world. It includes students from high school all the way to residence trainees. Um, it has students from engineering, from marketing, business, management, uh, cognitive science, um, of course, medical students and public health students are part of it as well. Uh, there are professionals involved in this group who provide support and advisement and uh, you know, guide us. That involves uh, faculty from medicine, from different uh, backgrounds, different specialties, professionals in medical device industry, and so much more. So just so that you have an overview of what the Students for COVID does, there's a website that you can go to, which is www.studentsnumber4covid.org. This website is essentially a central resource that is created by Students for COVID team. Um, the team uh, on its first meeting had six members and today has over 60 students. Uh, and about 20 faculty. Students are from 40 different uh, countries and faculty from 12 to 15 countries. So um, if you go on the website, you can see that one of the most remarkable things about this website is that there are no individual names. Uh, the website's mission clearly talks about how the students came together to form grassroots efforts and they wanted to support the global pandemic. It talks about um, the partnerships that we have. One of its major partners is Incision. Uh, Incision's COVID response has been fantastic. We're very thankful to everyone who signed up for the COVID responses. And uh, as part of that response, we formed four teams, public education, social media, uh, multilingual Q&A, and webinar. This webinar today is part of what the webinar team has put together. The other teams from Incision joined Students for COVID and have been supporting the efforts of Students for COVID. We have Sedona Foundation, Masks Now, Aclavis, Pan Am Trauma Society, to name a few. We have endorsers such as uh, IFMSA and Women in Global Health. So it's really about community and coming together to stand together to support one another and to fight misinformation, as so many of you have mentioned in your conversations today and your presentations as well. So there is a portal for healthcare providers where you can find clinical guidance, latest from journals, whatever is being published is filtered through. A faculty help us um, and guide us on what is important to post. Um, there is information on leadership during pandemic, some research registries that are very active right now. There is a section for webinars that we post webinars from the past webinars that are coming up. If there is a video associated with the webinars so that everyone can share information with one another. There is a segment dedicated specifically to students where you can find um, COVID curriculum. Uh, we, you can find other tools for education that can help strengthen your core education right now as you're at home. There is a segment that, um, dedicated to community. We have reliable resources um, such as WHO and CDC. We have regional resources listed. We have information for vulnerable um, populations, indigenous populations, etc. There is a segment for initiatives. These are the grassroots initiatives that have registered on the site so that we can feature them. Um, the map, I guess, is having a difficulty right now loading. There's a map that, uh, that has uh, all their locations and then they are divided by different regions. For example, in the region of the Africa, you can see Ethiopia, you can see uh, Somalia, etc. You can see different countries and we list every initiative by what, by what they do and how you can reach them, how you can get support from them, or how you can provide support to them. We have advocacy issues that we are highlighting because right now, more than ever, there are advocacy issues that we should be aware of for, uh, for example, gender equity issues. Um, there's domestic violence issues that we should be uh, aware of. There's health equity issues, access to PPE. And we partner up with different organizations so we can tell you how you can help support those advocacy issues. There is a section of the site dedicated to wellness. I heard a few of you also talk about that. It's very important right now. Um, you know, whether you're at home, 
quarantined or you're working at the front lines, there are different wellness issues that are really um, at high demand right now. We have support hotlines, we have art therapy, online communities, there's a writing section, uh, and we have information for meditation and yoga. There will be sessions uh, for uh, art therapy that you can get online and paint with others while you're online. There will be peer um, support groups that are going to be on Zoom coming up. There's a segment of the site that deals with um, supplies. So we are trying to connect hospitals with donors and suppliers around the world so that they can um, have PPE, hopefully. Uh, and this is an ongoing process. And then there's a segment dedicated to events where we have um, our last event was the uh, global celebration of unity that some of you attended. Um, it was when we uh, got together with medical students from around the globe and took uh, the Hippocratic Oath all together at the same time. It was held on 27th of uh, April and it was a beautiful celebration, brought a uh, global community of over 400 medical students. Uh, it was attended by overall 560 um, people who were faculty and students from around the world. We counted over 60 countries were represented at the event. There are videos of this available. You can contact uh, students for COVID at the email address that Sora provided, and also they are available on um, almost every social media platform from Facebook to TikTok. Uh, and it's very simple. You look for the handle at students number four COVID, and you'll be able to find them. Um, with that, I'm going to pass this back on to Ahmed Reza. Thank you, everyone, for everything that you're doing every day. So uh, thank you, uh, Ahmed, go ahead. Uh, thank you, sorry, I, I was uh, challenging with my microphone. Uh, thank you very much, Cathy, and that was incredible. Uh, I know that you are not exp you, you are not supposed to uh, have presentation here, but uh, we all know that it's not possible that we have you in a meeting and we do not you know, invite you to give a you know, presentation about your incredible work. Uh, uh, that's not possible. You must, you know, uh, always tell us and, you know, share your great experience with us. And uh, that, that was incredible. Thank you, Kate and Dr. Swarup. So uh, I also want to recognize that, you know, it's not, there's not just one organization. There's not just one whatever. Um, you have, we have to recognize like there's so many organizations that have done such incredible work. Um, one surgery has done some amazing stuff, right? They've done beautiful, beautiful cutting edge work that is amazing. Um, and I think that that is, you know, really important to recognize. There's IFMSA that's done amazing advocacy work. Uh, there are amazing groups. And you guys are all, so, th that's the beauty of this, right? Is you students are so amazing and so innovative um, that you guys inspire us to do stuff, right? You are very, very inspiring. So I just, uh, thanks Stephanie for, uh, coming and we'll chat later. Um, so the two questions that we have, all right, um, one of them is the main concern in most, uh, I'll say low resource areas, uh, not just LMICs, because there's a lot of areas here um, in a lot of high income countries um, that, you know, getting students back into the wards you know, how are we gonna get students back into the wards without PPE? You know, how can that be addressed to get students back in school? Ideas? Anything? I think we can go um, first. Um, so that is a, a reality, at least like uh, in Brazil, as I, as I told you guys like before, um students do represent like uh, a part a portion of the task uh, of the like the health work task force mm -hmm. um that many hospitals when in mostly in the public sector cannot op 
operate without. So they cannot afford taking the students out of those spaces because of the, let's say, of the high amount of patients that there are. So at least what I know from my university and, and what local schools in, in the southern region of, of Brazil um, are doing is that they're taking like case by case, like what wards um, students would be like less exposed to and uh, what wards like uh, students like should not be allowed into due to the high prevalence and um, fortunately like in in those specific cases they're like the specific hospitals I'm talking about are big enough let's say to carry uh, different entrances for example for COVID related work and not related work so in the absence of PPE uh, those types of uh, work redistribution can be um, uh, of course a very short-term um, solution um, but it has let's say been addressed in this way in some parts of, of Brazil and um, there are some like medical students that are still like attending these spaces despite you know um, the social isolation in the pandemic so just putting in like that would be like one strategy well, it still puts you guys at risk because there are so many people who are you know uh, still asymptomatic yeah so um, I think that some of the resources that we've put on our, on, on the, the website, Students for COVID, is about knowing your rights as medical students, um, because it's important to still stay safe. Um, and there's always a power dynamic, right? When you're, uh, when you're told to do something, you feel as though you must, right? But you have to care for yourself. Um, there, after we, after the global unity uh, celebration, there was a physician who contacted me uh, about, you know, there's a secondary portion of the Hippocratic Oath, right, about self-care. If you don't care for yourself, you can't care for others. Because if there is no you, there's no patient. Right. And that's why they say, like, there's no emergency in a pandemic. Right. So. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. And in, in these cases, like, just to be clear also, because, uh, yeah, medical students are still not obliged, let's say, to, yeah. to, to go like, to attend classes. So that, I think that is important and part of the part of like raising our voices and trying to make a point is to to not be treated as a number you know within the workforce but uh, as a specific member you know that has this types of characteristics and requires this types of space in order to be successful like in order to be helpful because i think that's the other point like that people think that we are like enabled to save like i'm a junior doctor and i and i'm like properly working but i'm far from being like super super trained in order to be able to save people like all of these situations and yeah think that is also but well, you can do so much right so of don't, course don't count don't don't uh don't <laughs> don't do that either. but can, in the balance in the balance it is let's say important to also have that portion let's say in mind absolutely absolutely anybody else want to uh say anything about that question actually i think what uh, what we can do is uh, like clinics uh, can be later taken later part like clinics and practical can be done after two to three months when the pandemic is subsides or when it goes to a plateau stage until now the professors and, and everyone can do the lectures or um, this thing through in videos from zoom and from whatever uh, webinars they can take at home rather than uh, gathering at pace, especially for first and second students, because uh, they don't have much of what uh, 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 things. They are just basically free and paraclinical, so mostly uh, not in contact with lots of patients. So they can be handled uh, very well at their home level, and later on they can do uh, their clinics from the part. Whatever the, like our universities are doing over here, I think it's a pretty safe for now, and they are. Uh, uh, Curriculum is not also hindered, so it will continue. And when the exams are then uh, after six months or seven months, whatever, so they can be ready by then to prepare for that. Yeah, I think it, it's it's very interesting. Here uh, we have like our more morbidity and mortality conference and our grand rounds all on Zoom now, 
and the attendance is very high by our faculty uh, because you know we don't have to be there in person and so the I mean it's just like skyrocketed and so everyone is like attending significantly more uh, so it, it, it's it's kind of it's kind of amusing but there's actually so much more engagement that I think it's it's showing uh, a I think there will be, there's lots of negatives to this pandemic, but I think that this pandemic is showing us what we are able to do when pushed to the edge, you know, and, and what we can actually achieve working together and also what we can do remotely. So I think that that is, uh, you know, definitely something silver lining-ish. So any anybody else want to say anything about that? Uh, hi, it's Christina speaking. Well, um, I would like to say that it really depends on a professor, at least at our faculty, because some of our professors are really doing their best and they're also making some kind of interactive appointments, while some other professors haven't even contacted students. So the students were the first to show an initiative, to send an email, to ask what's happening with lectures, so will you organize anything? So I think that that may be a bit of a problem, but then again, some professors say that it's due to their uh, other obligations regarding pandemic. So, I mean, we can also understand that as a student that they're really otherwise engaged, but at the same time, we really need to continue with our education so they should try to organize their time in a way that our lectures also go absolutely uh, i think you're you're 100 percent right um and you know we're christina we're going to talk offline that's why dr kielb was actually um here is because of you um and your email so uh we'll uh we'll discuss further later, but yeah, um, we're, there are many different, you know, um, tribes, okay? Uh, so like the neurosurgeons have a calendar of all of the neurosurgical potential events that are happening. Urology has all of these different lectures that are happening online that you can listen to. And so what I kind of want to do is like, put all of those things as a resource somewhere so people can actually find them, right? Um, and if there are requests for certain kinds of lectures, have a you know repository of attendings who can potentially you know give lectures at certain times and students can sign up to do those lectures, right? And have learning. So we'll talk about that offline uh, and we'll figure that out okay thanks absolutely my pleasure all right so uh, we'll go to the second question um, thank you for your wonderful presentations uh, we can see that the pandemic has affected our population in specific ways in your opinion how can students trainees and early career physicians be best supported during this stage of the pandemic? So how do you feel that people can be supported during this stage? How can, I guess, your, your consultants, how can others support you? Um, so if I can jump in, uh, I would say one of the, it's maybe just taking care of their frustration. I, f I know, I think that the medical community, I mean, the medical student community now and the junior doctors and the one who just graduated are uh, going through some frustration and it can be in a, from a various range. And if we just find out this, this, uh, those frustrations and take care of them, I think we will have all the answers. As an example, 
some of us are frustrated that we are we are kept away from the front line and we want to to be actively uh, involved in the response so i think and we know that if, i mean all the system in the world are over are over and and they need extra extra ends to to fight the pandemic so and so we are very relevant and we are we can be very helpful i think maybe that's one way to start to when the medical the medical student community want to be involved to listen to them and to plan this and in the other in the other end is we need to be protected you know in those uh, in this in those kind of situations uh, experience is very important so when you are on the front line, you don't get contaminated or you don't have to go home if you're living with your older parents and, uh, and you don't have to, to fear that you will contaminate them when you go back home. So if we are being involved, we need good protection and, and PPE. So uh, because some, the two extremes are possible. On the hand, on one, on, in one hand, we cannot be involved. In one order, we can be involved, but not being protected enough. So we need the, that as well. And the third thing is, uh, uh, we can feel that like staying home and being uh, staying home and wanted to to have um, you know educational resources, and we can access them. I think having those institution and organization like incision and student for COVID uh, or any other one or IFMAC sharing educational um, contents and resources is one way to to keep you know the community the medical student community um, together and make sure that um, they have the correct information because you know access to online information is not enough we have to know where to find the correct uh, resources and where to where to have them, so we feel updated. As an example, uh, with this online survey we did with Haitian medical students, we realized that they didn't they don't really know what is going on about the COVID nineteen in Haiti. They they know better what is going on in the world than what is going on in Haiti. I think at the national level they need uh, good communication, and so they feel like they are, uh, they, you know, they, if they want to intervene, they have the correct information to do so. And they, they feel that their country is actually, I mean, I am saying that mostly for low income countries. So they feel that their country is uh, responding and doing their best to find this, this pandemic. So Jean, what you say is so, it is so interesting for a multitude of reasons because your frustration you're not alone in your frustration um there are so many people who feel frustrated right now because they can't help um being isolated at home for a couple of reasons um, because of the fact that you know, they were saving us for ICU care, right? Uh, and at the same time, like, I really wanted to help, right? And also didn't purposely want to put myself at risk of getting sick, right? So I've been talking to people who are frontline workers, right? And you know, you were talking about having adequate PPE, et cetera, when you're working on the front line and being protected, listening to your frustrations and stuff like that. And I don't know how the best way to listen to specific frustrations except for having communities like this so that we can hear right, what the frustrations are, and then make action, right? Because listening to frustration creates more entropy, which creates more frustration and doesn't lead to change. 
So we can have a forum to create change and, and then move forward. But so, so that's a productive then, you know, listening to, to, to frustration. Um, but when, when you need to vent, we, we vent to our friends. So I would tell you, as, as I, I've done with my friends who are on the front lines, is to call them and listen to, to their issues and be there and listen like, you know, like I had such a bad shift, you know, it keeps getting worse every day, you know. And I'll tell you, one of my very good friends lives with his mother, who is near 90. And he tells me that as soon as he gets home, he's in New York, he basically strips his clothes before he gets into the house and douses his entire body with hand sanitizer, okay, and sneaks up the stairs so she doesn't hear him, takes a shower, okay, and then takes an, uh, uh, you know, alcohol, wipes down the staircase and all everything that he has touched and acts like a criminal in his own home and then puts a mask on so that he can be around her. And my partner who has a four month old has to wear an N95 when she's at home and her baby doesn't recognize her with the mask on at all. Yeah, and I would like to, um, following what you just said, I think another thing to support uh, junior doctors and medical students is like mental, mental health assistance. Uh, like you said, we are going through different situations and for, for the juniors, it's mostly new. As an example, a junior, uh, some juniors will avoid like emergency rooms as specialization or surgery because they feel a bit sensitive about people dying and they will, I mean, want to avoid having an, a certain uh, number of patients dying. But maybe the first day they go on the front line, they are seeing this new disease killing um, uh, um, hundreds or thousands of people. Yeah. And they are, if they are in the front line, they are seeing this, like it's close to them and it can, it can be traumatizing. And, and sometimes I know all of, um, some of us want to go in the front line and I think supporting us as well is know how to say, you can't be here because I mean, it's, it could be maybe not a good way for you to, 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 to start and to, you know, to have to deal with this so early in your career. And that is very important. And also for ourselves, we have to question ourselves. I know that all individuals are different and some of us can cope with the situation better than others and we have to ask this question because sometimes because we feel the dirty we will go on the front line and say i can't handle this but consequences uh, can come on our mental health maybe weeks and months and change all our careers and i can guess that some people will go from surgery to or for emergency medicine to pediatrics or to any other specialization because they will see what I've been seeing during this COVID-19 time. I don't want to see this anymore in my life because it was too hard for me. And I know some stories, people leaving medical school or leaving medicine because they have been facing some traumatizing events and they didn't have the correct, um, I mean, um, mental preparation and prevention for that and as well assistance after this i think all those need, need to be taken in consideration and make sure that our future i mean the future of medicine the future of healthcare, and the future and our junior doctors uh, have good mental health support but i, I have heard some stories about uh, senior doctors going into you know, suicide and depression as well. I know this is today is about medical student, but I just want to add that, that even senior doctors need assistance and, and you know, generally that all healthcare professionals uh, need uh, mental assistance. And this is, that should be an integral part of the pa um, pandemic response, uh, response all over the world at local level, national level and world, um, worldwide level.
Yeah. Mental health is a very big deal in, in uh, the world of physicians. And it's probably one of the biggest gaps that we have, uh, especially for physicians. We don't talk about it, right? Surgeons are the worst, right? Hands down, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, trauma surgeons, right? But, you know, you try to have like this distance, right? Like I'm a big bad surgeon. I don't feel it. Yeah, you do. Everybody does, right? That's why when you operate on somebody, you always have the most, you know, you're, you're connected the most. You care about that patient's anastomosis the most, right? Okay. It's not, it's not that. There's no more intimate way to be a part and be with a patient than it is to be inside of somebody or to operate on someone. You cannot be more intimate with a patient, right? That bond that you have with someone. And that um, aspect of mental health, right, that you bring up, Jean, um, has been discussed so much as of late um, about watching patients, especially because their families can't be with them, right? They're, they're passing away, they're dying alone. And doctors and nurses are stepping into this family role so that patients aren't passing away alone. And we're learning that humanistic value once again, that we pushed away and decided not to feel a long, long time ago. And I think that as we slowly evolve as a society, right? And as a medical community and move towards, you know, self-care and people are more cognizant of depression, anxiety, and the suicide rate of physicians and surgeons, they will see that this is happening. But that is something that we have to work on. As a, as a community. And I think that, uh, you know, that's something that I give back to you all. So we have been definitely on this call for now, way over time, okay? But that's what usually happens when we have a very, uh, uh, you know, bonding and good meeting, right? That's what always happens. So um, thank you for letting me be a part of, uh, of this. This was beautiful. Um, and I urge you all very much to, you know, send your stories, um, send your experiences during COVID, your education, your heart, your family, anything, all right? Um, I provided it here in the chat and I also put it on Facebook and I'm sure you all can get a hold of Ahmed or Kathy or anybody. Um, and it should absolutely, uh, Makina, be, you know, all over. There's peer-to-peer -peer, um, mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer support groups. And we'll be doing that also. So, you know, keep an eye out. Um, and uh, absolutely. So I'll uh, give it back to Emma and stop talking. Thank you very much, Dr. Storb. Uh, uh, during the meeting, I had several text messages that, you know, were saying, uh, how incredible this meeting is and how incredible you're talking and you know you're supporting the students all the time 
and we just we, we just can see you know the uh, chat room right here to see every, how everyone thinks about uh, things which are going on right now. Uh, since uh, we've passed the deadline, the time uh, many minutes many minutes ago. Uh, I would like to appreciate you all for attending this session. This was the first session of a student webinars on COVID-19. And we will have these sessions weekly next week, I think on, uh, on Thursday at 5 p.m. GMT, if I'm not wrong. I doubt it between five or six. It depends on our faculty moderators. So please uh, be you know, be in touch, be tuned, uh, and uh, check our social media uh, through the week, during the week, and uh, we will inform you about the next session. Uh, I would like to invite you all to the next session and also ask you to invite your friends and appreciate you, your, uh, your presence here and Thank you, everyone. Mekina, if you have any word to say, I would like to have a few seconds, minutes to hear you. That's fine. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, just your attendance and everyone's ability to either listen to everyone's stories or share them is incredibly important, especially given what everyone is going through right now. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, there will be weekly sessions. Um, and they will hopefully keep, uh, stay as interesting as this one was today. Hopefully a little bit more to time as well. Um, if you have any ideas, please don't hesitate to contact us through any social media. We would really love to hear your views and that is the central message we're hoping to go forward with this. Thank you. Thank you everyone, have a great time. Thank you, bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye everyone, thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.